Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during this presentation, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, June 17th edition of Crop Talk, and uh, today we are uh, going to be getting a bit of a canola update and uh, from, I guess, across Western Canada and as well as uh, how things are going in Manitoba here. We have uh, Angela Brackenreed on. She's the, an agronomy specialist with the Canola Council of Canada and uh, works in the, I guess, the north of Brandon area uh, in, uh, in Manitoba here. After that, uh, we'll be going to our crop scouting panel. Uh, there's again a, a good number of questions coming in, and so we'll try to get to as many of those as we can uh, with uh, with the time we have. Uh, I'm just going to show a couple slides here on my update today because I want to get right into the presentation. But uh, I think the biggest thing or the biggest issue we've been facing in the province right now is the strong winds. Uh, they're uh, really delaying herbicide application on all crops and uh, crops are still growing even though it's windy. So they're advancing and we're starting to run into some challenges with, uh, with herbicide application. And I think uh, what we're gonna see uh, shortly here is uh, some weeds that we're not gonna get as good a control of and uh, we're really gonna see, uh, really gonna put a lot of chemicals to the, the test this year. Uh, there is still some reseeding happening and uh, some of it's due to insects and some of it's due to some of the weather events that we've been having. And uh, as you can see by the uh, seeding progression uh, table there, we're about 97% uh, complete uh, as of uh, yesterday's uh, crop report, which is pretty close to where we've been on average. And so we're, uh, I guess in my books, I would say pretty close to being done. Uh, one thing about the winds, we had another uh, we had a windstorm on Sunday night, Monday, and then we also had another windstorm last night. Uh, the one last night was more through the Somerset Holland area, and you could see uh, wind gusts as high as uh, 120 kilometers an hour in uh, in the Somerset area and the Holland area, looking like about 110 kilometers. Where the blue dots are the wind peaks, and you, so you could see where. We had, and uh, we're getting several reports of damage throughout uh, throughout that area right now this morning. And uh, so there'll be some. Uh, uh, I haven't heard of any uh, major rainfall amounts yet, uh, but I definitely heard of uh, a lot of wind events happening there. So that's going to conclude my update right now, and we're going to turn the screen over to to Angela now, Lori, and we'll get uh, an update on the canola. All right, thank you, Lionel, for having me on this morning. So as Lionel said, I'm going to um, talk a little bit about uh, how the canola crop is looking across the prairies and in Manitoba, um, and and talk specifically about establishment issues and, import and the importance of assessing your, your stand and, and stand density. First off, uh, always a, a nice opportunity to, to promote our uh, Canola Council resources. If you aren't a subscriber to Canola Watch, I'd really encourage you to, to sign up. Uh, you can go to canolawatch.org. This is a weekly um, agronomy newsletter in the growing season, monthly um, in the off season. And our <clears throat> agronomy team spends a lot of time um, considering what is timely articles for that week. And uh, if there's something specific to your area, um, it would be be sent to you based on your um, based on your your geography. So this is uh, just an exceptional resource. Okay, so as far as the update uh, goes across the the prairies, generally we have a crop that's anywhere from just popping out of the ground um, to rosette stage not not any further advanced than that um, as far as I, I understand. 
in previous years, it, it always surprises me how similar things are across this massive geography as far as timing and, and crop stage and seeding progression goes. Um, <clears throat> this was a spring of really variable starts, even in, in small regions. Um, it was cool across most of the prairies, delaying our, our start um, much later than, than normal. Many regions were very wet, so producers were kind of picking and choosing where they could where they could work. Um, you know, I found it interesting, even just in, in my own little area where I farm, how you could completely cross some fields and then right across the road, um, you couldn't turn a wheel. And that that seemed to be the case in a lot of these wet areas. By and large, um, now the crop is is looking fairly good. Of course, there are issues in every region. Um, and as we move from from that Peace River region all the way through eastern Manitoba, um, you know, there, there's different stories that depending where you are. So the Peace River region, uh, they were dealing with upwards of a third of their canola crop to harvest this spring. And that was coupled with frequent and heavy rain storms that uh, that made that extremely challenging and and of course made seeding and, and seeding preparation very difficult or impossible so their crops are quite delayed and seeding plans were changing constantly as crop insurance windows kind of came and went um at moving further south in alberta there was recent severe storms that you may have seen on the news um calgary and south bringing extreme winds uh flash flooding uh, heavy rains and and hail, um, and and I'll have a couple pictures later that uh, will show some of the results of that. Northern Saskatchewan looking quite good, uh, from what I understand, getting timely rains and were quite timely with their seeding operations. Strangely, um, as you start going south and east of of there, um, the crop is further behind, which is a real flip of of what we normally experience. In Manitoba, the Northwest, uh, parts of the Northwest anyways, are struggling with dry and uh, as well as these high winds that we've all been experiencing. Some reseeding due to flea beetles, frost and high winds. And unfortunately now they haven't had much rain and uh, have been seeing fairly poor emergence on those reseed uh, acres. In the southwest of Manitoba, we've had a, a, a pretty delayed spring. <clears throat> Weed growth um, has also been delayed, which is, is kind of nice uh, when, when planting was delayed. And, and really just generally the calendar date is not reflective of what's been happening in the field all spring. In the interlake, um, they, I, I don't have an estimate on acres, but they have had significant reseeding largely due to frost but coupled with other factors as as well if it weren't for that their crop would be significantly more advanced than ours here in the westman area i suspect central manitoba um similarly very wet as portions of of the southwest and and they were delayed and and struggled to to cross fields um eastern manitoba would be the the furthest ahead um earliest seeding and uh furthest ahead of crop stage Really, very little precipitation this spring in in uh, a lot of the south, and um, not to a significant degree when you get into the Red River Valley either, which has been a blessing for for most farms. It's uh, I, we'd be in a in a bad situation if we had, you know, even near normal precipitation this spring for a lot of these areas that that were still quite wet from from last fall. Generally, I would say um, in Manitoba we have canola ranging from cotyledon to the three to five leaf stage. There is a lot of canola in the cotyledon to two leaf stage for June 17th. Um, but like I said, the the calendar date is not really reflective of, of the growing season thus far. Okay, so canola establishment issues in 2020. So in many areas, too wet. Let's see if I can get my presentation to go and we'll get on to the next one. Um, and then we had the very opposite, too dry. And in some cases, we started out too wet and then uh, some field operations to just make the 
some of these fields passable, all of a sudden we were then dealing with too dry. Poor seedbed conditions as a result of mostly too, too wet, you know, when we're trying to seed through mud, um, it doesn't matter. I don't, it doesn't matter what kind of drill you're, you're running. Um, it's really hard to get good field finish uh, when it's wet right to the top. Wind has been the story of the spring. <clears throat> we were just discussing this morning, is this normal? Um, and it certainly doesn't feel normal to me. I mean, we're always fighting with, uh, you know, playing, playing the wind when, with herbicide applications in June, but uh, having wind gusts 50, 60 kilometers per hour every day uh, just is, it seems so unusual to me and, and has been very frustrating. Frost um, in, in some areas, not widespread across the prairies, but certainly has been, uh, has been impactful for, for some farms. Flea beetles, of course, we can't uh, have a, a spring anymore without battling flea beetles, cutworms. Um, and then, you know, we have these areas that uh, kind of unfortunately have experienced all of the above. So too, too wet um, and, and seeding through, through, you know, mud right, right to the top was the experience for a lot of, uh, a lot of growers in Southern Manitoba this spring. And, um, you know, a lot of these fields could have just used uh, another week, two weeks of, of drying. But when we were pushing against calendar dates, uh, that really was not uh, an option. And then on the flip side, uh, we ended out with, uh, we ended up with some areas that, um, that had poor emergence, poor germination uh, be, because of lack of moisture. And, and that you know, was in, in a lot of cases coupled with this wind or, or, or exaggerated because of the wind. Like I said, uh, we did have a lot of field work going on, trying to get fields passable. And then we just, you know, we had that wind and we didn't get any rain at all after. And, um, and, and we you know, really dried out that top inch, two inches. So we saw quite a bit of this where, where the canola germinated, um, pushed out the, the hypocotyl and then, and then just desiccated and, and, uh, and really poor patchy emergence because of it. And, and some, of, some of these issues um, ended up being a reseed. If they were lucky and caught a rain afterwards, those fields look quite nice. Now seeded into really warm soils and, and rain shortly thereafter. But unfortunately, as I said, up particularly in the Northwest, that, that wasn't the case and, and we're still seeing some issues with emergence. Cresting has really been an issue in, in the valley in some fields, making it difficult for, for the canola seedlings to emerge and making them more susceptible to, to flea beetles, um, root rots and, and other damage. Some areas um, have really poor seedbed conditions, not necessarily crusting. Uh, just trying to seed these fields that, that really weren't in condition to, to seed. Um, you know, so now we, we had this lumpy kind of um, a soil that was a challenge for the canola to, to make it through. And it seemed like, it, and it always seems this way, you get one stress and the flea beetles just really take advantage of that. The canola is not growing well and, uh, and it's, it's difficult for it to, to get through some of that feeding. This uh, is from my colleague in, in Southern Alberta, Autumn Barnes, um, from that recent storm that they had. I was talking about that big storm system um, in, in Southern Alberta. You can see, I mean, this is just a horrible situation. They, this, the, these fields were quite advanced um, and, uh, and large proportions of the field, it sounds like just completely sheared off. Uh, this was also happening uh, in portions of the Northwest this spring and I haven't heard any updates, but you know, if we were getting 120 kilometer an hour wind gusts last night, I suspect um, or fear that uh, this may have happened in some areas in, in Manitoba. And unfortunately, you know, if, if that growing point has been sheared off, that's kind of game over for that, uh, that little canola plant. But, but this plant here on the right, um, it's possible it could shoot out uh, new growth and, and survive, but now you know we've really got to watch these fields because really limited leaf area um, really just can't afford any other uh, major stresses or incidents on them after, after that. 
I would recommend, you know, if you're in these situations, go out and flag a bunch of spots and come back to them daily, every, every couple of days and, and see if you are getting some, some new growth coming. Frost didn't affect ma major acres across the prairies, but we did have some pockets in Manitoba where it was significant. Um, around Highway 16, north of Highway 16 at the end of May had a, had a frost event that, that saw quite a bit of reseeding. And there was substantial acres in the interlake, as I mentioned. Also scattered around the prairies, kind of normal, um, not, not super unusual, although I would say it had the potential to be a lot worse if the crop was at a more of a normal um, stage for, for the calendar date. Of course, we've been dealing with flea beetle pressure this spring that at times uh, has been very intense, similar to the last couple of years. Um, incredibly frustrating for, for producers trying to, to battle this. Um, and I think many producers have been spraying foliar insecticide in, in some cases multiple times in, in the same field. In the past couple of years, um, you know, this is anecdotal, but, but many producers were finding that if they delayed their seeding date to around that mid-May timing, it, it really helped uh, with this issue. But that didn't seem to be the case this year. And I've now said it uh, probably four times, the calendar date just really wasn't reflective of what was happening. Um, you know, we, we see flea beetles start emerging kind of based on a temperature signal. And, um, and so as such, I, I think that happened later this, this spring. Um, I do, however, think that that we've largely had this beat now, knock on wood. Um, either the crop is getting fairly large, as you can see this picture on the right, that's, you know, there's three, four leaves there, um, or at least two leaves, and it's getting fed on. But when you have that leaf area, it's, uh, you know, it takes a lot longer to, to get to that uh, threshold for, for leaf uh, area defoliation. We've also seen um, newly emerged crop isn't dealing with the, the level of infestation that, that some of the, the crop seeded, you know, uh, mid May saw. So just a reminder, as far as thresholds go, uh, we have an action threshold and an economic threshold for, for flea beetles. Um, the, the reason for two is just that, uh, we know, you know, the, the, leaf area defoliation can increase from 25% to action threshold to that economic threshold within the day. Um, so if you're seeing 25%, then you need to be prepared to get out there with a, a foliar application. This is way easier said than done um, because it's never or very rarely a case where you're able to just go across the field and take a, an average. Usually we have large areas of the field that are completely fine. And, and little patches that, that they fed so aggressively on that you're starting to lose uh, those seedlings. And, and that's what was happening with, with the wind. As we uh, had a lot of stem feeding because in that wind, the, the flea beetles were kind of get, getting cover underneath the cotyledons feeding on the stem. And I mean, it takes, it takes two, three, four bites on that stem, um, particularly when we had the wind that, that we were experiencing. And, and you've severed the plant and it, it's gone. So, you know, obviously we know that the, the flea beetle needs to ingest some leaf area to ingest that insecticide. Um, but when, when they're feeding on the stem and it just doesn't take many bites to finish off the plant, that's, uh, that's not gonna be that, uh, that effective. Um, cutworms have again been pretty widespread issue this spring, although surprisingly to me, there seemed to be more action taken in cereals than in canola. Um, and, and there is a lot of cutworm seed treatments on canola now, so and, and they are very effective against cutworms. So I wonder if that is, is part of the reason for that. Um, thresholds for, for cutworms, I find really difficult. Um, you know, we, we talk about a stand reduction, 25 to 30%, but the problem is it's not as though you have one of every four plants snipped off evenly across uh, the field. You get big patches uh, where you have no plants remaining, uh, but thankfully spot spraying for, for cutworms can be effective. Once uh, they reach that inch, inch and a half, they're soon to pupate and likely aren't feeding much anymore. And I think we are at or, or nearing that point for, for um, 
cutworms in Manitoba anyways. So there's a lot of different species of cutworms that have slightly different life cycles and, and feeding habits. Um, in Manitoba, um, we've, there's, well, there's different species of cutworms, but dingy and, and redback seem to be what we often see in dingy overwinters larvae. So they're likely the ones that were out feeding the soonest. Uh, redback overwinters eggs. So if you're still seeing some that are actively feeding now, it's possible that they'd be a, a redback cutworm. And that's this guy on the, the right hand side, dingy over here on uh, this one for sure in the middle would be a dingy cutworm. Um, so hail and, and stormy weather is as another issue for stat or canola's establishment this spring. Yesterday uh, was a little scary here in Minnedosa, but uh, I, I fortunately don't think it, it amounted to much. It was uh, just a, a big show for the most part. Um, I was saying this morning, I have a tin roof on my office and, and I kept thinking I was hearing hail and I'd run out and go check and it was just really large drops of, of rain. And I haven't heard uh, yet from, from across the province um, if, if everybody else got as lucky. This picture came from a former um, Canola Council summer student of ours uh, north of Dauphin from a couple of days ago. Um, I, uh, again, haven't heard the extent of the damage. I guess, you know, if there's a silver lining, if we're going to get hail, it's it's better to get it early in the season when we have lots of time to, to uh, recover and, and regrow. Okay. So that basically is the issues we've been having, but I should say uh, we do have a pretty good looking crop coming now. And a lot of the fields um, did dodge all or, or at least some of these major establishment problems. So I'm gonna switch gears slightly um, and to talk about assessing our plant stands now. Um, I think you know most of our crop is anywhere from two to six weeks from seeding and it's a good time to do that. This is a Canola Council's um, plan for reaching an average yield of 52 bushels per acre um, across the, the prairies. And, and to kind of break that out, you can see each of these pillars and, and where we think that yield is coming from. So under plant establishment, improvements in establishment, um, we feel that we can capture another three bushels per acre. And there still are, are a lot of improvements that, that can be made in, in canola establishment. So our stand establishment best management practices for 2020, of course, setting targets. So we're past this now, um, but but our recommendation, five to eight plants per square foot. Take care when seeding, protect your seedlings. I mean, this is the most important operation on the farm. We have to try and do uh, the best we can do with, with this operation. Really only, you know, hopefully only get one chance uh, to do it. Now we're kind of at this point of, of evaluating our stand and, and evaluating our, our practices and, and then reevaluating and, and making plans for next year. So that's kind of what I want to focus on. So if we are to make informed seeding rate decisions, we need to know our farm's average emergence percentage. And there's no other way to know this than actually physically getting out in the field and counting plants. So as I said, now is, is a good time uh, to be doing that as a, a final spring plant count can be done you know, three to five, six weeks after, after seeding. So how do we do that? Um, I like to use a, a hula hoop. I think most of the Canola Council agronomists use hula hoops now. Uh, you can use a square. Uh, if you are if you forgot both, like I often seem to, you can, uh, just use your feet and and kind of estimate a, a square foot and in you know representative areas across the the field take a bunch of different counts and and average it uh, so if you're looking to use a hoop um if you you know make one or can find one uh, that has a diameter of 56 centimeters that gives you an area of a quarter of a square meter it's kind of a nice size to to get a representative count uh, or uh, just less than 50 centimeters will give you an area of two square feet. Um, I do know a lot of people count um, per length of row, particularly as you get into wider row spacing. So here's uh, if you, you know, want to convert that to what you have for plants per meter squared, or then convert that further to plants per square foot. So you're, you're taking your plants per meter row 
whatever that count is times 100 and divide it by your row spacing in centimeters that gives you your plants per meter squared divide by 10.76 and you have your plants per square foot okay so of course we needed to do that to get what our plants uh, per per area is to figure out what our percent emergence in that field was this year so this is the equation to figure that out 9.6 is a constant times by your your plants per square foot times your thousand seed weight divide that by your seeding rate in pounds and that will give you the percent of seed that you put in the ground that emerged and unfortunately uh, the results might shock you a little bit we have long estimated based on results from other canola research that emergence across the prairies is frustratingly low uh, between 50 and 60 percent survival. Most farms believe that their emergence is higher than this, and in some cases it is, um, but impressive canola emergence is still usually no higher than 70 to 75 percent. And, and we really have to do everything right and have a little luck on our side to be that high, um, start doing things wrong or, or, you know, have environmental conditions not really on your side like we did this spring, and we can easily drop below 50 percent. This, what, what you're seeing on the screen right now is a prairie-wide stand population survey of canola. And, and you can see that a lot of the prairies is below our target plant stand recommendation of five to eight plants per square foot. So uh, here on the side is the categories of, of plants per square foot um, corresponding to the colors uh, on the bars, the province and the years. So uh, taking a look here at Manitoba, most recent 2016, 65% uh, of our surveyed fields uh, had less than five plants per square foot. So from maybe just a little less than 65% from here down. Uh, substantial, you know, pushing 45% had less than four plants per square foot. So remember I said five to eight is kind of our recommendation. Really, though, for me, four to five plants per square foot doesn't make me nervous that, you know, we know we can we can um, get phenomenal yield from from a plant stand of four to five plants per square foot and sometimes lower. But that's uh, with the caveat that it's fairly uniform across the field. This um, what this is looking at is the amount of fields surveyed that had suboptimal densities in areas in the field. So you can see Manitoba in 2017, we had over 80% of the fields surveyed with patches that had less than four plants per square foot, indicating some non-uniform non stands or, or most of, of the stands surveyed were somewhat non-uniform. And recent work has shown us that patchiness might be more of a detriment to yield than general low plant populations. Okay, so now we're all going to get out and start counting our plants uh, so that we can make informed decisions with our seeding rate uh, next year. Really, um, there's there's just no point in, in seeding too much, and in a lot of cases, that is what's happening. If you're seeding five pounds and you have a a small seed that's three, four uh, grams per thousand, you're in a lot of cases, uh, depending on your survival, could be seeding far too much. So this is um, it's it's really economically in your favor to have a, a at least an idea of what that uh, per survival percent emergence is on your farm and then of course the flip side of that if we have seed that's six seven grams per thousand we 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 don't we don't want too little either so it's about optimizing so we can use this awesome online application at canola calculator.ca to help us with a lot of this math uh, some of those equations that that i gave you you can use it to set um, Plant density targets, calculate your seeding rates with multiple scenarios, factor in seed costs, and then go backwards and, and find those emergence percentage like I talked about. So let's flip through this quickly. Um, you know, we're past this point already, but for next year, it can help you calculate your, your seeding rates with your, you know, whatever your target plant density is, your estimated emergence, and your seed size. Um, you can go the other way and figure out what your plant density would be at your desired seeding rate. And then what we're trying to do right now is figure out our emergence. So you would just punch in the, the average densities you're finding, what your seed size was, 
and what your seating rate in pounds was, and it will flip out your emergence percentage. There's also kind of a neat uh, function where you can save this um, for, for your records. So you're going to canola calculator calculator.ca into the seating rate and cost calculator and then under emergence to, to find this. Um, our emergence is going to vary from field to field. It will vary from season to season, but with enough records over enough years, we can start coming up with, with an average um, that, that will help us with a more informed um, seating rate decision. So I did um, start off this presentation talking about all the challenges we face getting our crop established. It certainly has not been an easy spring for anyone, <clears throat> but I think we are nearing that point where we can uh, start sleeping a little better at night. Uh, and most of our crops out there, I think, are looking are looking excellent with uh, with really great potential. It amazes me every year what uh, what those little seedlings can can get through and and still turn into a, a pretty impressive crop at the end of the day. And and so a lot of you know I've just noticed really in the last uh, in the last couple of days few days that we finally can row out these crops as as we're driving. So that's uh, that's a relief I think for most farms. So that's all I have on, on establishment. I just want to wish everybody the best of luck with uh, the 2020 growing season. Okay, thanks, uh, Angela. I just got uh, one question for you here. Um, uh, where do you, uh, how far behind do you think the crop is compared to, you say, a normal year? Oh, just one question, but a tough one. I, well, I would say you know we're we're normally um, well average uh, at a rosette stage by now, uh, with you know our herbic herbicide applications complete in canola, and and we've got a lot of first pass herbicide applications to go. So we're um, you know we're at least a week, ten days behind in a, in a lot of areas. I would estimate. Okay, that's what I would have said too. So. And uh, one quick one that just came in here. Uh, uh, have you seen any issues with the new lettering system on some of the canola bags? Yeah, so they uh, be referring to the invigorate uh, system. I, I think there, there is a lot of education about this. For, so for the most part, uh, producers and, and retails were prepared uh, for this. <clears throat> but uh, there, it, you know, everything new comes with its challenges. In my mind, it's, uh, it's a really good thing to to make it um to really draw people's attention more to the variation in seed size that we have so the reality is is we always had seed lots with varying seed size uh you know you could have one lot on the farm in the spring that was a three grams per thousand and another that's a, a seven and uh and i think having that a b c d plastered on the bag really made people aware and uh and made them vary their their seeding rates; otherwise, the bag wasn't gonna wasn't gonna seed the 10 acres that that uh, it should. So, yeah, there's been some challenges for sure, and, and some growing pains. But but overall, I think it's been positive for for most farms. Okay, uh, good. Well, thanks, Angela, for the update, and uh, it's good to know what's happening across the prairies and how our crop uh, compares. So. Uh, with that, we're going to uh, bring up the panel for uh, some questions. And uh, here's uh, members of our panel, and uh, there's the information for if you've got questions uh, to send to Lori and myself uh, for getting the questions on the uh, on the uh, crop talk. So, um, first question goes to ta uh, to John. Uh, uh, guys have been scouting their fields, and they've been noting, noticing whitish bite marks on the leaves. Uh, what is your opinion, John, as to what is happening here? Okay, uh, this one here looks like uh, a bug called green plant bug or green grass plant bug. They, they're uh, a little bit bigger and narrower than a ligus bug and green um, with usually reddish antenna. Uh, sap feeder, so they, they make these little spots on the leaves. 
We've seen quite a bit of it this year. The plants do seem to outgrow this, though. They're not really considered a major pest of cereals. We do see usually a little bit every year, probably more this year than normal. But generally, the plants cannot grow this type of feeding quite well. OK, thanks, John. Uh, next question to Dane. Uh, producers are asking about the white rings uh, on the canola plants, usually on the cotyledons. Uh, uh, your opinion as to what's causing this, Dane? Thanks, Lionel. Um, that halo effect on canola, uh, you could actually flip me over to my screen. I have uh, one or two pictures here to share. That would be great. That halo ring on canola can be one of two causes. There we go. Uh, are you able to see now? You bet. Wonderful. One of two causes, uh, either frost or seed treatment. Um, a, a light frost that might just touch the, down on the field and lift right back up, um, just below zero, zero to minus half a degree kind of thing for about an hour, hour or two. That may cause yellowing on those cotyledon margins. It, it um, would be death of that exterior tissue followed by necrosis. So if that if that is suspected, do check that growing point and stem as well to make sure that they are uh, still untouched. If that was only just the leaf margins, generally it's no further concern, but do keep an eye on flea beetles since they do seem to be attracted to canola that's already damaged. It does uh, produce a gas that uh, flea beetles are able to use. Most commonly though, that halo effect on cotyledons is from seed treatment under uh, optimal or normal conditions where you have warm temperatures, adequate soil moisture, and that canola is really leaping out of the ground, like it has been on some later seeded fields that are really getting going now because the soil temperatures are 15 to 18 degrees. Uh, so rapid growth of those cotyledons and those seeds can translocate seed treatment uh, and that insecticide portion from that seed treatment coat to the margins of the cotyledon, causing that halo effect. It doesn't affect the plant health, and the seed treatment is still is just as efficacious as it was before. So it's just a visual thing. It doesn't uh, hamper yield in any way. And then, yeah, just look at those margins. Make sure your main growing point is healthy. And as long as you have a, a good stand or good emergence like Angela talked about, and that density is still increasing as you're at this stage, there is no cause for concern. I'm just going to chime in. Sorry, I'm going to chime in here for a second and say it could also be chromosomes. So there is the, um, um, yeah, there, there is a chance that it could be a herbicide as well. Um, not the symptoms that Dane has up on the screen right now, but just that really light halo. And again, no economic concern. Uh, if you're controlling cleavers in canola, then sometimes you will see a little bit of a halo, especially if um, you have tighten the window between herbicide application and emergence of that canola crop. Oh, great. Thanks, Danny. So would we see that on any other leaf besides cotyledons, or would it just normally show up on cotyledons? Um, in canola, I've only seen it on cotyledons, um, but I've done it on flax just to show what the injury symptoms, and it can be on the growing point. So um, it's going to be your first leaf tissue because the chromosome will dissipate uh, fairly rapidly. Um, it'll still impact on the cleavers for quite a while, but the canola is not as sensitive and it really doesn't have an, any, any economic impact whatsoever. In fact, it just shows you that the herbicide's working. Okay, thanks guys. Uh, Laurie, if you can give my screen back. Uh, next question is for uh, Dave Kaminsky. Uh, Dave, a lot of the winter wheat is starting to head out or will be heading out over the next week. Uh, so producers are starting to talk about fusarium and, and uh, applications of uh, fungicide for fusarium. So uh, when would be uh, the kind of the timing for fusarium application? I don't have Dave on uh, this morning. Um, can someone else take that question? Okay, I'll uh, try to answer it myself here. Uh, basically, what uh, you should be looking for is uh, the flowering stage of, of your crop. So basically, once the head starts emerging is usually when guys are looking at, uh, at the application for fusarium. So uh, from the picture here, probably another week to 10 days before applications will be uh, looked at. 
And I just wanted to uh, mention that we should be looking at the heads and the main tillers and, you know, early to mid flower. So making sure you're looking for those bright yellow uh, anthers coming out of the heads. Okay, great. Thanks, Anne. A uh, question for John. Uh, I was at a producer's field uh, last week and patches were showing up in the field. And we went out and we determined it was uh, wireworm. Uh, the question is, how should he manage this field for the rest of the year and, and maybe even for next year? Well, there's, there's really nothing you can do this year, unless it's a reseed situation. But if it's not bad enough to be a reseed situation, there's really nothing you can do this year at this point. Uh, with wireworms, there's no foliar insecticides that would work. The seed treatments, the ones on the market right now, will make them sick and prevent their feeding. And the, the species of wireworms we have here have a multi-year life cycle as a larva. So if you've got them in the field this year, the patches tend to remain uh, fairly static, the same fields, roughly the same areas for a few years. So if you're planting a wireworm susceptible crop next year into the same field, note where those patches are and what fields they're in. And those are the fields that you might want to use uh, one of the, um, the, the, the seed treatments that control wireworms. Um, there is a new product coming out probably in a year or two that actually kills them. Right now, uh, the products just make them sick. So even if you do have, say, a cruiser or um, Sombrero are one of those products that kill wireworms on the seed. Do note that they have a multi-year life cycle and that they can still survive with those seed treatments. They just, the crop is just able to get off to a good start. And so how long will they continue to our feed uh, during the, uh, I guess they have multi uh, cycles, so they'll continue to feed through the whole growing season? They will, but uh, when the soil warms up and dries out, they tend to go quite deep and they don't do nearly as much feeding uh, throughout most of the summer, throughout July and August. Uh, later in the summer, they will come back up towards the soil surface again. Uh, so if you had, say, a winter cereal going in, uh, wireworms will be closer to the soil surface, maybe feeding a, feeding a bit more actively late in the season. So that's when we really see them up near the soil surface doing a lot of feeding is early in the season and later in the season. Okay, thanks, John. A uh, question for Tammy. Uh, a lot of producers are starting to spray their flax now and getting a lot of calls regarding best method of spraying flax, you know, always getting injury, what type of staging, timing, split application, and is there products that you could be adding to the tank that will help to reduce injury? Okay, so there's not a huge amount of options for flax um, and it isn't a very competitive crop. So the best stage is when the weeds are small and you can kill them. Um, but that being said, the optimal time with most of the broadleaf products for flax is between two and four inches. Unfortunately, with the heat that we've been having, anything over 27 degrees and you're probably going to get really, 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 I don't know how many reallys you want me to put in there, limp flax. So trying to avoid um, heat is important. And in fact, a couple of the labels suggest 48 hours between temperatures of 27 degrees or higher and when you do the application. So it's a bit of a balancing act because we do know that some of the weeds are going to grow quickly during this time and there's limitations on how well we can control kochia and Canada thistle and those types of plants in a flax crop. So as early as you can without stressing out the flax so much and then split application or not, um, there are supported tank mixes where you can put a graminicide and a broadleaf together, but there has been concern with certain graminicides that there is some antagonism when you add a broadleaf partner. So don't cut the graminicide rate or do a split application. And if you're doing a split application, do the graminicide first and then wait a couple of days and do the broadleaf. If you do it the other way around, you need to leave more time because the broadleaf will have an impact. It'll stress the flax. It'll 
also um, the surfactant also impacts on the grasses and it just takes a little bit more time. If you do broadly first, you usually wait five days before you go in with the graminicide, whereas if you do the graminicide first, you can usually tighten that window down to about two days and still not stress your flax out too much. Um, so I prefer the split application because I want to kill all of the grassy weeds and all of the broadleaf weeds. There is, um, there's extra travel time, there's challenging spray conditions. So if you aren't willing to do the split application, then make sure that you have a supported tank mix where there is minimal antagonism and that there's no cutting of rates. You're using a good water volume and you're getting the coverage that you need. Uh, do the products you add to the tank help reduce injury? My school of thought is if it's helping to reduce injury to the plant that you're not targeting, it's probably reducing injury to the plant you are targeting. So if it's um, helping your whatever crop grow, it's helping the weeds grow too, um, or it's causing a little bit of antagonism, which ends up looking like less crop injury. So that's my theory. It is not super based on science, but that's how I roll. Um, so I tend to put the herbicides in and get the weeds dead and try not to look for a foliar reprieve that's going to perk up my crop and somehow magically not perk up the weeds. That's all I got. That's a good point about the add-ins. Um, Timing-wise, I get a lot of questions about spraying late in the evening or in the, in the evening compared to spraying in the morning? Um, okay, so it depends on what you're using uh, and lots of different things, what weeds you have. So I prefer to have the uh, plant architecture at a point where like your lambs quarters will close up at night. So I like to spray it in the morning when your leaves are flat and you're going to get the most impact on that plant. Um, there's also uh, the school of thought about when you're using contacts versus systemics, that if you're using a, oh, and I forget this off the top of my head, sorry, Lionel, I can add this in later, but um, spraying in the evening and in the morning, it, it, it depends on which one works better. And I completely forget that off the top of my head. I've been focusing on on just knowing two to four inches for flax and what some of our tank mix options are. So I'll add that into the notes with Lori when she sends out the webcast about when a systemic is better versus a contact as far as morning versus night, unless you can remember, Lionel. Uh, I'm gonna let you handle the rest of that because it might <laughs> be an educated guess, but it still could be a guess. So. Okay, so we'll add it into the notes here and into the pest report that's coming out uh, later today, hopefully. Perfect. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, thanks, Tammy. Uh, John, question for you. Uh, I've been, uh, was talking to one of the crop scouts and he was asking me with all the winds we've been having, is it going to be affecting uh, what we're catching in the traps, whether it be Diamondback or Bertha? And then also with all the south winds we've been having, could we be seeing an increased number in pests? Yeah, those are really good questions. Uh, with the the first one, the two moths we're targeting with these traps are both nocturnal, so it's really the evening temperatures and wood speeds that would affect their activity. And with both of them, if it's too windy, they're going to be less active. So uh, good point. Uh, the, the very windy evenings, those evenings, we would expect to see less moth activity in flight. On the calmer evenings, those moths would still be quite active and more likely to show up in our traps. Um, but if you get consistent evenings with heavy winds, uh, it's quite possible they could go through a good chunk of their adult stage uh, without really getting some good evenings for flight and uh, egg laying. We have been seeing some spikes in, in the diamondback traps in the eastern region. So last week we had some pretty high catches. So we are still picking up some in those traps. Uh, regarding the south winds and moving insects in, uh, that's how insects like diamondback moth, the, the aphids that eat our cereals, soybean aphid, the aster leafhopper, that's how they all come in. And we do know we've had some diamondback moth come in um, primarily into that eastern and south interlake region. So we're keeping an eye on that. 
as far as the AFID situation goes, um, there have been sightings, but very small numbers of soybean aphid in the Dakotas, but very small numbers at this point. So nothing we need to get too excited about right now. Um, none reported in, in Manitoba. Uh, for the aphids from cereals, they've been moving north with the winds. They have arrived in North Dakota, but again, not in huge numbers. So just something we'll need to watch over the next uh, week or two as well. Okay, I was uh, talking to uh, Amir the other day and I mentioned that uh, my diamondback uh, moth trap uh, in, in one area landed up about halfway across the field before I could get it back. So uh, I wasn't catching many that day. Next question. Um, uh, this would go to start with Anne. Uh, what is happening to uh, this corn plant that was in a couple of corn fields the other day and we seen a plant looking like this so I thought I'd send it to Anne and see what she thought was going on here. Uh, so leaf purpling uh, especially at this stage is a sign of stress in the plant. Um, the leaves are actively producing sugars um, but some so the stress is actually allow not allowing the sugars um, to be translocated within the plant and that pigment is associated with the sugar buildup within the leaf tissue. So this can happen because of stresses such as um, uh, temperature stress, uh, moisture stress, restricted root growth and development, or herbicide injury. Uh, the good news is that plants typically grow out of this stress. And um, at this stage in the plant's development, um, you know, there is lots of time to grow out of, this, out of the stress and the growing point is still below ground and hopefully not being too affected. And I think John also had something that he wanted to add about purpling on corn. Okay, thank you, because obviously it's phosphorus deficiency, Lionel. Uh, you found this single plant in the field you were telling me? Whoa, so whoa, 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 wait up. Obviously, the one plant edge. was phosphorus deficient. Edge. Herbicide injury. Come on. It's oh, always herbicide no. injury. We all know if you Google it, purple plants are phosphorus deficient. <laughs> so, uh, uh -huh. Obviously, like Ann said, there are num numerous stresses, and but I'll let you take first crack at this, Tammy. Uh, which of your herbicides is going to do this to my corn plants? Um, so typically, I get calls that this is herbicide carryover, and typically it's ethyl fluorolin that is blamed. I guess for me, my first question is always, what do the roots look like and what else might be going on? So I was being facetious and a little bit edgy, just like you were last week. Um, so John, back to you. Oh, well, I'm just saying that, uh, Lionel, you told me this was about the only plant you saw in the field. And I, I think that's just kind of like, uh, I don't know, picking out a smart dresser in a crowd. There's always one uh, around this office. Of course, that would be me. But, you know, when you find these things that are just anomalies, you just check it off to it. it, it it's being something out of the normal and uh, you go on until you find some patterns or more. Now, I'm hearing of some of this or other things and uh, a, a good crop scout is going to try to solve a problem for future. So that's doing some diagnostic soil and tissue testing to find out if it is nutritionally related and while they're digging I, I think Angela did really well she mentioned that there's a lot of buggered up seed beds because we were in wet and we're seeing some really bad rooting because of the sidewall compactions the clods other things so if we check roots the nutrients might be in the soil but the roots are not uh, accessing them well that's all I've got to say about that Okay, and uh, while I've got corn up there, John, uh, a lot of guys uh, that uh, do split applications uh, are probably thinking about the most the best time to go with the second application. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Well, that, that, my, my opinion is they can stop thinking about it and they can start doing it. Uh, you know, over the last, since 2016, we've had like, I tallied up 48 experiments in Manitoba looking at nitrogen out or close to seeding versus in crop and um, uh, uh, 40 
four of those 48 times, there was no difference between nitrogen at seeding uh, versus a split. Uh, and in the two cases, there was a yield reduction when people waited too long to put their split on. Uh, just because people can wait until the V9 stage doesn't mean you should because occasionally we'll starve that plant a bit late. Uh, and in two cases, we actually did have a yield increase with uh, a split application. Most of the time it doesn't matter. So it's a case, once you can drive between the rows of corn, you just get the job done now. My, my only other comment would be getting the job done means if you're side dressing with ammonia or even 28%, make sure those slots are closed up. Uh, we see some losses and uh, you, can ha you can drag hardware behind your injectors to close that slot. Don't leave those slots open in 2020. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, I think Tammy got our answer about the flax and Tammy, if you wanted to maybe chime yeah. in right now uh, uh, regarding um, best time for evening or morning spring. Okay, so for the graminicide, which would be systemic, do it early in the morning after the plants have recovered from the stress, it's better. Whereas if you've got the contact herbicides like the bromoxynols or bentazons or those types of things, the first few hours after treatment are the time that is most critical. So if you want to minimize injury, apply those in the evening. If you apply them in the morning and then you get some really hot temperatures again, you'll do a better job on the weeds, but you'll also do a better job of hurting the crop. So uh, contacts in the evening and the systemics in the morning. Great, thanks, Tammy. Um, next question is, uh, there's been some reports uh, of IDCs maybe starting to show up in some parts of the province. So I thought uh, Dennis Lang and Laurie, if we can hand the screen over to Dennis, he has a couple of uh, slides to discuss this. Morning, Lionel. Uh, we're just gonna show my screen here and we're gonna go full screen here in a second here. Can you see my screen okay now? You bet. Okay, so a couple quick things, uh, just to kind of give you a bit of background on IDC. Uh, typically, it's the plant's inability uh, to make chlorophyll um, because the iron is not available. It's not that the iron is low, it's just that with very high carbonate levels in the soil and very high soluble salts, that iron gets tied up and the plant can't take up the iron that it needs. Um, things to kind of keep in mind, typically with carbonate levels uh, greater than 5% and salt levels greater than 1%, uh, micromole per centimeters, there, that's where you see the greatest risk of IBC. Now, with some of the recent wet soils that we've had in some areas, uh, we're starting to see a little bit of that uh, come into place. Now, what's interesting here, this is from a chart from the MPSD fertility fact sheet. Here is that carbonate greater than 5% um, and the salts greater than 1, you're at that extreme level. But if you were to actually look at uh, just the carbonate levels on their own, and if you had high carbonate levels but low salts, that, it, that does definitely increase uh, uh, your risk for IDC. Now, that information can be gathered from a previous year soil test. If you've uh, soil tested for carbonates and salts, uh, you see here on this, on this uh, chart here, uh, carbonates were 5.9 and salts were 0.87. Um, so something recently has come out from AgVice here and it kind of, something that to, just to be brought forward here. Um, here's a slide here where you see no chlorosis you have carbonate levels very low at 0.9% and salts at 0.4. Uh, soil pH really doesn't factor into it, uh, you know, as, uh, as once we would have thought at one point in time. It still is fairly high here, but here you have a nice green uh, plant. But what we're kind of sometimes seeing this year is even in areas that haven't had that excessive rainfall, um, the, the salt levels have been quite high in some of these fields, and you're starting to see this, see this uh, chlorosis starting to happen. It'll start off as a yellowing intravenal chlorosis on the new leaves. And if it's a susceptible variety and the symptoms persist, you'll actually see some necrotic tissue start to show up. So just a few things to kind of manage it going forward. There's no real quick fixes when you see it in the field. Uh, the best thing to do when you see it in the field, uh, make note of the variety that was grown in that field. Uh, so for next year, when you're picking varieties and you're going to be uh, planting beans on that field maybe in two years from now, uh, you can pick a variety that is considered tolerant to IDC. 
also do a soil test, you know, and, and try to get a handle on where your carbonates and salts are in that field as well and try to pick your variety. Um, there's been some work done with iron chelate products uh, as an in uh treatment at planting, but they're not going to take a susceptible variety and make it tolerant. It'll take a moderately or semi-tolerant variety and make it a little bit more tolerant, um, but it's not going to take something that's, you know, uh, you know at, at three or four on, a, uh, on the IDC scale and, and improve it to a one. That just doesn't happen. Um, iron does not uh, translocate through the leaf, so spraying it on the crop, you know, really it might give you some temporary relief, but it's really not going to help the IDC problem long term. And it'll only affect the leaves that it, uh, it touches. So at the end of the day, if you're seeing IDC out in the field this year, um, you know, keep an eye on what variety it is. You know, check the, gut, the Manitoba seed guide. Seed Manitoba, you can see whether or not your varieties are tolerant or susceptible. The list that I have on the screen right now has mostly tolerant or has some tolerant varieties, but they have a lot of semi-tolerant varieties in here as well. And the semi-tolerant varieties, when, they're in, when you're in that 2 to 2.2 range, meaning that if you have those conditions uh, that are suited for IDC development, i.e. wet conditions, high carbonates, high salts, those beans will yellow in that second to third trifoliate stage. Um, but typically will recover when you get better growing conditions. Uh, with the salt levels that we see sometimes in some fields, sometimes those symptoms can persist. And the work that's been done in North Dakota suggests that if it persists into the fifth to sixth trifoliate, you can see yield losses of up to nine bushels an acre and, and more depending on how severe it is. So just a couple of things to kind of keep in mind. Great, thanks Dennis. Uh, Laurie, if you could pass the screen back to me. Okay, I think uh, that's all the questions we have for the panel today. So uh, uh, again, uh, we're well into spraying season. So if you still haven't got your book, I think there are some still available in some of the offices. Uh, the reports, uh, they're always being updated and new ones coming out. Uh, Tammy and uh, John mentioned the insect and disease and crop uh, report that they'll be putting out. Uh, the Fusarium weather maps are up right now, so if you want information, definitely go to the Manitoba Ag website. Uh, all the weather stations, that's where I got the information about wind speed this morning. So, uh, good sources of information on our website. And uh, once again, I'm going to put up the Back to Basics, the uh, spring weed identification that was done by Tammy Jones, a good uh, webinar to watch and, uh, and uh, get a better understanding of some of the uh, the spring weeds are early seeding identification. Again, the uh, extension specialist for this uh, for Manitoba here. Uh, again, if you have questions, uh, feel free to call any one of these people. Uh, they've been uh, several years of experience and definitely know know what they're doing and can give you a hand in solving your 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 field issues. And. Uh, Lori Forbes information for getting your credits as well as sending us questions. So uh, with that, I think uh, if there's no more questions, we'll end the webinar and join us next week, June the 24th.